Welcome to APAC Med, the Asia Pacific Medical Technology Association. I'm Andrew Fry, Chairman of APAC Med, the only regional trade association representing the medical device, equipment, and in vitro diagnostics industry. We are the voice of over 140 companies across Asia Pacific. Since our creation in 2014, APAC Med's reputation continues to increase, not only among the industry, but also across ecosystem decision makers, from regulatory authorities to ministries of health, as well as capability experts like our own consultant and service associate members. APAC Med's strength and expertise lies within its core functional teams. We call them committees. From regulatory, government affairs, it's almost and 11. Access, Welcome, everyone. I can see people joining. Startup community represented in our small and medium sized company. We're trying our new video for you to be entertained during this time. Over the past year, these APAC Med committees published more than 20 relevant papers and policy submissions on topics including reimbursement, regulatory harmonization, HTA, as well as top in our code of ethics. To foster access, APAC Med is keenly focused on member education. We do this by leveraging industry leaders and the experts in our own ecosystem via virtual and face-to-face -face dialogue. Last year alone, we delivered nearly 40 programs for our members. Our signature event, the MedTech Forum, connected more than 1,000 attendees, including regional and global leaders this past year. Asia Pacific is on track to achieve unprecedented growth. And by 2022, the value it is 11 of the tech so I'll give it a minute or two. billion US dollars. This comprises developed markets from Japan and Australia to China, India, and emerging markets in Southeast Asia. Together, this makes Asia Pacific the second largest med tech market globally. Given this variety of markets, the needs in APAC are diverse and show no signs of slowing down. It is now more important than ever that as an industry, we come together as a collective voice, united by a single mission to advance standards of care and leverage our expertise to ensure high quality, accessible and affordable healthcare for all across Asia Pacific. In 2020, as the world grapples with COVID-19, we witness a surge of innovation. Our employees, customers, patients, and clinicians are all clearly embracing connected technology. This underscores APAC Med's digital focus. Our newly formed Digital Health Committee aspires to drive a common strategy with all member countries and our global peers in Europe and the US. We will focus on security and privacy regulations, as well as interoperability standards and reimbursement. As such, we made Connected Care the focus of the 2019 MedTech Forum and see this as an area to go deeper, with a focus on patient journeys in particular. Going further in 2020, we are engaging with the technology ecosystem as cloud, AI, and collaboration tools increase further, enabling our med device to med tech industry digital transformation. I have had the distinct pleasure and honor to serve APAC Med since 2018. And as chairman of APEC Med's board of directors since February 2019, I work hand in hand with my fellow board members and the APEC Med Secretariat team. Our ambition is for APEC Med to be the driving force in the med tech industry as we adapt, reinvent new business models, and drive product innovation in this new era of tech enabled patient centric healthcare. If you aspire to raise the standards of care, improve access, and shape tomorrow's healthcare policy, then we invite you, I invite you, to join our community. Okay, so that was our video. We'll try to turn that one off. Welcome everyone. Let me share the welcome slides, I guess. Can you see my screen? Yeah? Can you see my screen? Yes? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, yes. So welcome everyone. So we're proud to announce that we have launched our new website. So that was a, an opportunity for me. It was launched yesterday. Um, and it's always nice to see people visiting. And uh, um, so the video that you just saw was there. So we have about 50 people that joined already. And uh, I know in the next few minutes, we might have some more. So let me try to, how do I do this? So today we are, have uh, our speakers that will uh, talk about coping through COVID-19. Um, we didn't call it mental health, but um, we are addressing digital health and mental health in this uh, webinar. And we have three speakers and a moderator that will be introduced to you later. Let me not, yeah. 
just a short intro. The, the, like in, if you've watched the video, the medtech industry is a is is a huge market in the in the region, and it's also representative of the huge population in in the region. I think over four billion people live around here, and there's a lot of um, aging demographic, chronic conditions that we're uh, seeing. So obviously, the medtech industry is investing heavily in tech and digital to serve many of the questions and needs uh, in the region. And the medtech industry itself represents over 350,000 employees in the region. So it's not, it's, it's huge and it's growing fast. So I'm gonna show you something. In the last two months, obviously, we talked about mental health and how you've coped with a lot of things, but uh, I kept uh, the same husband and kids. And the only uh, way for you to see my smile was through uh, Zoom. So obviously I can smile today, but in the street, you've seen me wear this. And unfortunately, you haven't seen me smile. So as much as my eyes are trying to show you. And I think that has, you know, um, make us, you know, deal with another things that we haven't uh, dealt with for a long time. So um, I think today I'd like to invite, you know, our moderator, Steve, to um, introduce our speakers and, and address those questions around mental health and how technology is uh, enabling us to address. So Steve, um, Dr. Tucker. Uh, he's an oncologist and primary care specialist uh, based in Singapore, uh, and he'll be taking his uh, uh, doctor hat and digital health futurist, I guess, to uh, moderate and ask questions to our uh, great uh, panels. And I'll leave it to that. Uh, I'll let Steve uh, talk now, and um, we will give it an hour um, and close uh, the, the, the webinar. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Great. Thanks, Marilyn. So uh, thank you and uh, APEC MedTech for asking me to moderate uh, this group. And I think we'll get right into it. Let me tell everyone who the three speakers, uh, participants are, because it, they really represent three distinct starting points that all land in mental health. Uh, Dr. Sarah is a classically trained clinical psychologist in private practice in Singapore. Michael is a mindfulness expert, author, and founder of Awakened Mind, which is certainly an app that you could download, but I think it's got a, a broader reach. And interestingly, and Michael will talk about it, in many ways it starts at the apex with, with leadership, but needs to diffuse more broadly. Jeremy is a physician who has come to population health, including mental health, behavioral health, through cardiometabolic disease, and is working in some ways, and this is artificial by, by my creation, that I can sort of put Michael at the apex of an imagined pyramid dealing with mindfulness and leadership, and Jerry approaching the base of that pyramid with the man in the street and uh, populations that may not have access to care. And, and last, uh, and Dr. Sarah knows this, I'm gonna hold her up as a, a full um, for a lot of questions because we have an assumption that face-to-face -face care is the gold standard in mental health, but digital disruption is something that's happening. It's something that's been talked about for a long time, but it happened literally overnight. And as an example, uh, Harvard uh, Mass General hospital in Boston had been giving approximately 1% of their outpatient care as telehealth services six months ago. They're now offering 86% of their services as telehealth service. So this is a disruption to healthcare and mental health care, not unlike or to say similar to what's happened to travel and real estate and going to the movies external forces or, or Uber or Airbnb, this is an external tsunami that's changing the way care is delivered. With that, uh, I'm also going to take one more minute to reframe a little bit. Today's discussion may be a little bit bipolar. Uh, we're going to talk some about coping and coping strategies, but a lot more about digital health, mental health, services just being disrupted. And the background for that is the statistics I looked up before this, in the US about 20% of adults 
probably need mental health services. That mental health and mental illness account for $200 billion of the healthcare budget, which is more than cancer and more than heart disease. That one in seven kids uh, has mental illness and that generally mental health problems begin in childhood. And as they evolve due to a variety of reasons, people don't have access to care. They don't have timely access to care. Uh, they don't know that care is available. And all of this as it evolves into adulthood becomes a huge financial burden uh, in terms of productivity, uh, et cetera. So with that in mind, let's start with Dr. Sarah. And um, Sarah, do you wanna just give us one minute? You know, I said what you do, but why don't you tell everyone else um, in your own words, uh, what you do and what you wanna get across today? Thanks, uh, Stephen. You did such an excellent job. I don't really have much more to add. So I'm a clinical psychologist in private practice. Um, I see clients presenting with a range of issues from anxiety, uh, trauma, depression. Um, I also treat or meet with couples who have issues in a relationship, infidelity or abuse, uh, etc. Um, what the, I think the second part of your question was what I would like to, to, to add or, or see happen in our discussion today. I really think the intersection between mental health services and technology is very interesting. Uh, and exactly like you said, it's been thrust upon us because of the safe distancing, the circuit breakers, and many, many, many of us who haven't used tech to deliver our service in the past are now, are now doing it. You know, we, we're, doing, we're, all, we're all doing it. Yeah, we're all, we're all doing it, right? So it's right. really interesting, and I'm looking forward to, to this uh, discussion. Great. Michael, um, you try to force tech on people. At least that's what I told everyone. Tell me, I mean, your app, getting, getting the awakened mind into corporates. Um, uh, how'd you get here? Quickly, 90 <laughs> seconds, no more. Very quickly, we wanted to make available at scale, uh, a, a, a method for people to grow in self-awareness was primarily our goal to help them develop because self-awareness is profoundly useful for mental health, but for anything, for self-regulation. We wanted to give them a quality, consistent product through the organization because we tend to just work at the elite level in person. Hey, Michael, let, can I interrupt you and ask a more, I, I, I want to get to something in your history. When I was looking you up, you started in a corporate life, I mean, in paper. How did yeah. you get from being someone who's in paper, manufacture sales and distribution to a mindfulness uh, expert? My mother, my mother started meditating when I was 11 and took it very seriously. And I, <laughs> like many people, I think I had a crisis when I hit my first work when I was 22. It was a bit like, is this it? You work, you go on holiday, you get married and you die. There must be more to this life. And so that's where it sparked a deep searching for me around uh, mindfulness, awareness, practice, a whole range of things. That's how, and then I was one of the very first people <clears throat> um, to find a way to make a living out of teaching mindfulness 20 years ago to corporate and government. And that was one big adventure. Okay. Dr. Jeremy Ting, um, what were you doing before you started uh, Nalori? Or, or teach everyone, explain to everyone what is Nalori, and then answer what were you doing before that? Um, yeah, so Nalori, in a nutshell, it's a digital disease management platform, and we specifically focus on uh, individuals with chronic disease risk. And we try to get them healthy through a multidisciplinary way. This means bringing together mental health and physical health and surrounding them with a team of coaches from psychologists but also with doctors, dietitians, fitness coaches, financial planners, and executive coaches. The thesis is that through this multidisciplinary approach, we'll be able to get people healthier um, in a much more sustainable way. And specifically, what we focus on is the health outcomes that we deliver. So we actually measure uh, physical and mental health markers before and after the program. Uh, the benefit is that hopefully, through, through this, we can help people who are paying for healthcare insurers and corporates to save on avoidable healthcare costs in the future. Um, how, how, a little bit about my background, so I guess uh, uh, healthcare background, I trained as a doctor, uh, or worked a little bit as a junior doctor and then transitioned to do uh, management consulting. 
uh, spent about uh, seven years in management consulting, uh, predominantly in healthcare, and uh, had the privilege to work on uh, integrated care systems in, in, in uh, the UK. And I think that's sort of influenced a lot of my thinking about how we can truly transform both the payment side, the provider side, in new ways to support you know, populations at risk that can be a lot more sustainable going forward. Thank you. That's good. So, um, like, I still believe you guys come from very different backgrounds to the same place. I'm going to go back to what I had, uh, came across speaking with, with Sarah. I, I've elevated face-to-face -face therapy or defined it as the gold standard. And Dr. Sarah told me in our discussion that the, they're, they're, everyone's busy. And it's a burden on the practitioners. It's a, you know, it's a different way of working. And it's hard to measure whether or not the outcomes are the same, better, inferior, we don't know. And so the, the broad question here for each of you is going to be, is face-to-face, -face, I want you to think back a year ago and what you thought of face-to-face -face therapy as a gold standard, and then project a year from now what do you think may be the standard? And let's, let's start with Jeremy. Well, Sarah, you'll get to go last. Um, so I, I think for me, you know, uh, as well as coming from a doctor background, I would say face-to-face -face is, is the gold standard. I think, you know, um, I still am of the belief that a lot of diagnostics um, uh, cannot be done through a telemedicine platform or it's just too, too expensive. However, uh, through the journey of Nellery, what we've been finding is that uh, often what you lose through face-to-face, -face, um, and, and specifically, I guess, in, in, in the mental health space, uh, body language, intonation, the way people speak, uh, you do gain from a digital medium. And uh, how we as Nellery specifically do it is not only just uh, video calls that, uh, that the traditional telemedicine model does. We, we also have text-based chat that, that, that goes over time. Uh, through this, we can also pretty much look at the data that we collect and start to create decision support tools for our professionals that currently have not existed. Um, we are, and I think we're only at the cusp of the technology that's able to drive insights and synthesize it in a way to make uh, coaches much more productive in a digital medium. So uh, one specific example, uh, which I think a lot of people are familiar with, is that you, know, you can mine Twitter and Facebook and you can see a sentiment analysis of populations that vote. And there's a big hoo-ha about that a few years ago. But similarly to how people talk on chat, we can look at the differences in how, in how they, they talk over time and whether there's an uptrend and whether there's a downtrend. And that has enabled us to start to pick up almost in a proactive way a couple of small cases where people were really depressed or even had maybe the emergence of suicidal ideation. And that's quite exciting for us because although, you know, I'll be last to say anything we are doing now is well leading, but, you know, it, it, it gives the promise that we can start creating these sort of tools that, you know, taps into large data sets and across many thousands of people and bring that information to bear when the individual human coach coaches the person behind them. And that augments essentially their years of experience also with a, 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 a data set that helps. So, so mining for signals. And I said, Sarah, you go last, but it prompts me to ask you, if you saw a teen with uh, maybe suicidality, profound depression, and you were able to interrogate a phone or their social media to see you know, that their so-called metrics were at least within some kind of boundary and not out of bounds. Would you wanna know that when, when you saw the patient or before? You're on mute. Um, yeah, I think that would be useful information, um, that kind of triangulation of data, right? Which I think as all practitioners, leads us to a, the most valid, uh, you know, conclusion. So yeah, that would be super inform um, useful information, how they present on uh, other platforms, especially with teenagers who have, you know, more limited roles than adults. So they are a student, they are a, a son or a daughter, and then they're a friend. And so much on social media now. So 
definitely the social media presence is relevant. Um, yeah, yeah and, and I would think being, I always, you have to do it the right way. Patients are not lying to us, but they're not always sharing their own truths. And, and they may not know them themselves, but this in theory could become an objective way to, to sort of define behaviors. So and I guess but, that's, a, that's very interesting because um, I think it also depends on where you're looking at it from, right? Because yeah. from an ethical perspective, like as a therapist, you know, I need to, to, to um, convey to my clients that I trust them, right? right. That, that regardless of whether their reality is the reality, I am willing to hear them and, and see them. Yeah. Yeah. So it's kind of like managing that that trust with oh no, but let me go check your like if I was doing a forensic assessment, it would be totally different. I would tell my yeah. the the client that you know everything you say to me, I will be checking with your records, and I'll be checking with this, and I'll be checking with that. But in therapy, I think it's a it's not quite the same. Yeah. Right. So. Some brutal so Steve, honesty. I, Go ahead, I could Michael. Yeah. On that, we found the same. Our work typically. Although our app is slightly different, our work is typically helping people grow and develop, which is around behavior change. And we found run into the same problem all the time is exactly what you said there, people's truth, what their truth, because they can really literally be deluded. Their truth of what they're doing and what they're actually doing can be quite different. So what we did um, about five months ago is we actually introduced a feedback system into our app. Uh, on So we when we invite people into... Uh, the, the app we're asking is a particular we give them a collection of behaviors healthy behaviors and we say would you like to work on one and then we invite them to ask people around them to give them feedback on how they're traveling once a week or once and that's very very useful because it, it's it's voluntary they want it they want to grow in that area and they find that feedback supportive and useful and that's a, a really we found that a really powerful way of using the technology which is also interesting because it comes back to the face-to-face -face question, which face-to-face -face has value, but group has value as well. And COVID-19 is highly disruptive to group therapy, if not even couples therapy. So how do you see your own either services or technologies changing to adapt to that syllability uh, of, of programs? Who are you asking that question to? Uh, the first one who answers, Michael, that's you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, we're of the view that there's place for privacy, obviously, one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and I think to Sarah and Jeremy's point, the gold standard is that one-on-one, -on -one, that safe place I can say anything. But there also seems to be, at least again, our paradigm is often developmental. What we call, we're working with a worried well. So we're working with people who are highly stressed or struggling, but they're not in that place where they need necessarily therapy, but they do need support. And we find the group process is very powerful because it creates an encouragement a momentum and a shared experience. So what, we accommodate that in our, in our technology, that people can connect with groups, they can have a group experience, they can run a group even by themselves. Um, and, we've, and our research shows us that it works very effectively. Uh, Jeremy, don't, don't fret. I'm going to ask you something about multidisciplinary in a second, but because that's a theme actually all three of you have brought up. Sarah, I know at Alliance Counseling, you guys have a weekly meeting. There are about 20 therapists of various stripes and, and service histories, but you all get together and talk about difficult cases, uh, common, common challenges, and, and support each other. But now you've got to do it on Zoom. Yeah. And is that, is it better, worse, no different? I would say that it's better than not meeting. So it's better than, better than nothing. Um, I think many of us, I mean, I think there is a magic about the face to face, right? There's a, there's something about being in the physical presence of another human being that is very uplifting, you know, um, and it speaks to the, our nature as humans that need for connection. <laughs> But saying that, we do. Mm. Oh, go, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, so it's, it's better than not meeting. I think, as also humans, we adjust and adapt over time, right? 
So the first right. meeting might be a bit weird, awkward, and you know, we have to take turns to speak and we have to hear our own voice and you know, and then over time, you know, you ease into you ease into something, you know, and it evolves. Yeah. It's interesting. I'm a, I'm a social person, but I find myself more engaged in group events like this, uh, smaller and uh, you know, that and and as we all know, we've can probably you've all connected to friends and family from 20 years ago that you didn't speak to as much. So that the crisis driven change here is, I, I think that digital has a lot of positivity in showing people how easy it is to connect. But let me go back to Jeremy because Jeremy's put together a team and you guys have all made this point. It's multidisciplinary. And how do we take the multidisciplinary group and then scale that sort of down the funnel back to the individual. Yeah, and I think that is probably, you know, a, a big question that we've been asking ourselves at Nalluri and we constantly try to kind of improve it because I think with Nalluri we had a dual, a dual mission, right? Number one was how do we deliver this sort of best gold standard multidisciplinary care to people with chronic disease? But also the second part was how do we make it accessible enough not only from a smartphone digital perspective, but also from a cost perspective as well. So I think for, for us, we need to kind of deliver this sort of multidisciplinary team that's actually tailored and personalized to a person's uh, individual journey, taking into account their unique set of uh, personal challenges. And uh, that's the only way we can truly change behavior. Um, so for every individual that we have, we wanted to make sure we don't sacrifice on that. Um, so we tried to deploy uh, uh, two strategies. Number one was how do we leverage technology to continue to improve co coach productivity. It's the main um, uh, uh, metric that we look at. And we did do that through several different means. Some through a process that similar to how a lot of advances in healthcare have taken place. It's about task shifting and building the digital tools to help that. Uh, the second bit was then to how do we build sort of other tools as well that can get information in a, a passive way from the individual, but also then tie that back to build decision support tools for the coaches, which we talked about earlier. Um, the second side from it was to make sure we actually coordinate the team behind the individual. And I think oftentimes when people think about a tech company, it's all about AI and all of that. But I, I like to call Nalluri a human-driven but AI-augmented uh, uh, solution. So even though you know, uh, we have all these digital tools and AI, uh, we still make sure every Friday, similarly to how you would have in a GP practice, you would have in a hospital, we, we bring all the coaches together on a Friday meeting where they can all um, uh, 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 sit together, talk about the toughest cases, have knowledge sharing. And this also then distills into our forever evolving coaching paradigm on the best practices as to how to uh, create behavior change in uh, the community that we serve because it becomes very specific in terms of language and culture and mindsets. The, um, there's one specific question. I'm going to stay with you, Jeremy, for a second. Uh, someone in the audience has asked how you are specifically using AI. And I know you and I talked about NLP, natural language processing. When do you think that's actually going to be deeply you know, not, not just experimentally incorporated into the program and which, which area of your cardiometabolic mental behavioral health program would be the best fit? Yeah, so maybe I'll preface this to kind of say, uh, it, it's why we've taken um, the approach to kind of make sure that the human is at the center of this, so it's human driven, but we, it, it, we, we bring the AI to augment the uh, healthcare professionals because I feel that AI in all its promise still isn't at a technological state where you know, it can do everything. So we use AI specifically for what AI is good at, right? Uh, pattern recognition um, and uh, uh, building tools that you can uh, uh, do, you know, see trends over time. So we use, for example, a very specific natural language processing on the chat side 
to look at you know uh, emotional states, but also whether there are large discrepancies in the way uh, individual talks over time, because that's also an indication that um, something has changed changed in their life. We then also use uh, AI to mine their food journals, their court journals, the modules that they do, and this is very structured information that we can then also compare on a large data set. Uh, to see uh, variances that were able to drive different sort of behavior and different sort of outcomes. So one example here uh, is that we are Let me stop see, you there. Um, I'm going yeah. to stop you at the example because I've given you too much time. We'll come back to your, sure, the sure. example of AI. Michael, no problem. where are you guys looking at, at adding this form of technology um, into either the app or whatever your, the Awakened Mind wants to do next? Uh, for us, it's a really, it's a, it's a quite a distance away because we're still in relative. You could say we've gone past the startup stage, but we're still in a relative place where the amount of funding for that kind of thing would be enormous. But what is most interesting to us is what Jeremy indicated. It's patterning because it turns out, and Sarah, no doubt, can confirm this. There are some some patterns. For example, if someone's struggling with depression, there's also probably anxiety. So your AI would connect the patterns. You're, there's also things like if you're struggling with anger, you, you might be stri struggling with um, sleep, for example. So it's about connecting. For us, it's about connecting the dots of the symptoms and, and suggesting or serving that person. Why don't you try this? Why don't you try this? Why don't you try this? But that's about as advanced as we're even thinking at, the, at this point. Well, let me jump ahead to one of the later topics then, which uh, is, is pretty appropriate to, for med tech. And that's digital therapeutics. So digital cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, Sarah, can you explain to the audience in one to two minutes or less, what is CBT? Uh, so cognitive behavioral therapy is a very established mode. Uh, so cognitive behavior. So looking at thought patterns, challenging maladaptive and negative thinking, activating behaviors, problem solving, um, CBT has also evolved to incorporate the emotional aspects um, and early childhood beliefs and stuff. So it's a very established way of uh, providing treatment, uh, demonstrated huge efficacy for anxiety and mood disorders. Yeah. So a variety of consultants such as um, CB Insights and uh, um, uh, Nightbridge, Whitebridge, all the groups that you know people at MedTech would be reading about Mental health and wellness, CBT specifically, there's mm. digital therapeutics and CBT, mental wellness and brain training, provider and therapist tools, there's uh, wearable tech and, and monitoring analytics and, and telemedicine, telepsychology, telepsychiatry, this whole breadth of services. Yeah. And, and like Jeremy, both Jeremy and Michael said, I mean, they're augmenting what you and your colleagues could do in, in terms of scaling. Yeah. So how do you price that? <laughs> right? You probably didn't see that coming, but how does, how does that work? And because if, I guess a few questions here we can cover in the next 10 minutes. Is digital CBT useful? Is it really proven? Back to that, what's our gold standard? And if it is, how do we make that affordable for the masses? Um, so, let me, anybody want to take that? Raise your hand and I'll, I'll say your name. No, no hands going up. I think um, if I just want to, to that first point about is it effective, you know, I think somebody had said whether it was you, Stephen, or Jeremy, or even Michael, that um, tech uh, therapy or, or, or tech um, tools have been around for quite a long time, right? Like 50 years. It's been around, but I guess one of the questions that I have is, or maybe we all have, how come it hasn't, like has it or has it not taken off? You know? Uh, I would argue it didn't take off until COVID. Yeah. It, it, well, it's because of the disruption. Yeah, and so effectiveness, there are quite a number of studies that have demonstrated that these um, CBT programs are actually as effective as uh, therapists delivered CBT. So there, are, there is quite a bit of support for it, but somehow, you know, I think clinicians are not so convinced. I don't know, or, or clients are not so convinced. 
Um, and this idea of a gold standard, you know, I think defining that gold standard is really important. If it's, if it's kind of imparting of information or skills based, I think tech is, is, has proven itself, right? But there's something right. that, there's, there's something that the face to face can do that the tech hasn't yet been able to hack, you know? And yeah. I don't think it ever, I don't think it ever will do. So in our world, Stephen, we see it very simply. Is that and I think the words we use, the need for empathy. So, you know, when, you, when there are mental health issues, the need for empathy is such a powerful need. And then you look at basic 101 therapy, the need for presencing with another person. Any, no technology can do that. But when it comes down to the guidance and practice and structure around actually supporting yourself, I think tech comes into its own and is actually a superior solution to um, therapy because you know a lot of a lot of times you end up in a codependent relationship with a therapist and you come to the therapy for your dose of goodness and then you go back to your dysfunctional life and i think that's where tech's role i think i personally see tech as filling in that gap of structured support for practice for self-authoring myself with the support of the empathy together i think that uh, there's jeremy you want to chime in before i try to synthesize um <laughs> I, I wanted to almost play a, a little bit of a contrarian view, right? And I think maybe here, I, I do agree that gold standard, you know, uh, from an individual basis, you know, there's a lot of value that face-to-face -face has. And maybe this is my coloring from a bit of a public health sort of view, um, is that I also wonder what gold standard is for a population. And for, the, the problem we have in Southeast Asia is that there's such a dearth of supply of psychologists. Uh, like in Malaysia, I think there are only 200 plus practicing psychologists and the ratios are, you know, less than 10 times, you know, uh, uh, compared to like a U.S. population. There's, or, or there's 10 population. per 100,000 mental health providers in, in Southeast Asia of all stripes. And I happen to know that there's 15 psychologists per 100,000 in North America. So, I mean, yeah. you're, it's bad numbers. Yeah. So, so for us, I think we you know what, what we are trying to develop maybe as almost redefining what gold standard could be was to say, you know, there are the five to 10% of the population that, that, get, that can afford and can access the, the, the professional psychologists in the clinic. But we know through, through many different stats and measurements that, you know, 30 to 40% of the population have some sort of mood disorder risk from, you know, whether it's mild or whether it's quite severe. How do we reach out to them? How do we develop services that they can afford and also they can access? Because sometimes in Malaysia, if you want to access a psychologist, there's a nine month waiting list or you have to travel, you know, 50 kilometers to, to see them. And at the price point of the, you know, the household income there, that's already, a, you know, almost like half of their weekly expenditure that they could be spending on groceries and, and other things as well. So, uh, you know, I, I think we're trying to think about it in terms of that you know, not only what is the best care for the patient, but also how do we address the barriers to access? I think it, it speaks that this, this has to change. And as, the, the, as part of this challenge, and, and um, Sarah, the point, I mean, sort of like, it's challenging. Is this good? Is it not good? How do we know? Um, I think it goes back to um, uh, sort of, and other professionals who have been disrupted where they've been fighting it and say, well, you know, you could, you can buy a house on your own, you know, you could do it, or you can, you know, you can do it all online or you can have a professional do it. And, and I don't, I, I prefer, and I'm fortunate that I have access to professionals, but there's also some things And Jeremy, you point out that the historical stigma in mental health, uh, people may want to do things privately. The reason that that I would argue, um, one of the supporting pillars that I would argue that the digital mental health is is now here to stay and will grow, was that pre-COVID, the presidential address from the American Psychiatric Association just last December, maybe even January, the four takeaway points were that individuals with mental distress receive no care or inadequate care. Emerging tech has solutions that reduce the gap. And that smartphone-based treatment is effective and, and scalable, but we still need to study it. And the study it is the next jumping off point for us because it gets to outcomes. How do we measure success? 
Um, Michael, I asked you a difficult question yesterday. You, the, the, the programs you run um, for leadership and, and management on mindfulness, and there was a lovely question here. Somebody wants to know, by the way, how you can incorporate mindfulness yeah. diff discriminately away from uh, everything else. And, and someone is unfortunately a corporate slave. Uh, I hope we can we can free you at some point. But how do you measure the success of leadership effectiveness or, um, you know, um, there was another term you used, but these seem like soft outcomes to me where Jeremy's going to be looking at uh, weight and dash 21 and, you know, so proven tools, hemoglobin A1C. Um, how do we measure outcomes? Because it gets back to the question no one answered, which is who's paying? Yeah, so in our work, uh, <clears throat> it's the biggest problem we've run into. And it's sort of somewhat to the question uh, of, I don't know how to pronounce your name, Dhruv. Uh, yeah. It's the same problem is that we, we if, because our work, our work, although we're available, it's kind of, so firstly for Jeremy's comments, is quite eye-opening for me because I see my own blind spots around you know, my world is the, is the corporate world. And so everybody can afford it. And the idea of not making it available. So it's like, thank you for that, Jeremy. You've given me a beginner's mind again on that one. Um, the What we found is that what interests corporations primarily, whether we like it or not, is the bottom line. And uh, linking mental health to the bottom line implicitly is not good enough. It has to be done explicitly. And we found this over and over again. Sort of, oh, general research shows that if you exercise more, your, your employees will be healthier and work harder, give them an exercise program. It's not good enough. What the organization wants to know is, all right, I put people through an exercise program. Did I get, what did I get for it? And so what we've done, um, we're very fortunate and we have a, a very good relationship with the University of Singapore because research is very expensive. And if you want impartial academic research is what we've done, you need to have someone like the University of Singapore. We've measured things which are still soft outcomes, but there's enough belief, if you will, in the corporate corporate world that, for example, a person's level of engagement at work, which is measured by say, stay, strive, which obviously has a huge impact on mental health. So do you want to stay there? Would you be given, would you be willing to give extra effort for it? And uh, would you say positive things to other people? I like jokingly say it's like a good marriage. You know, if your marriage is good, you're going to stay, you're going to strive, and you're going to say good things. If it's not good, and we also know that leaders have a, a response of about a third of a person's mental health and the way we measure it can explain the direct reports. So the way the boss is behaving has yeah. a huge impact on mental 360 health. 360 review. Sure. Yeah. So, and we've correlated those two. So we've kind of given a very simple measurement of mental health in the direct report. And then we've gone to the leader and we've measured the way they lead. And we said, whoa, there's a, there's a third correlation there. The person's report, self-reported mental health, but there's, Engage is probably the highest factor that organizations are interested in. People who are mentally unhealthy as a tent will tend to not be as engaged because they're struggling with their own, their own sure. world. And our research shows that engagement does improve quite dramatically. Uh, University of Singapore's research, when right. people practice mindfulness, when the leader practices mindfulness, emotional exhaustion decreases in their direct reports because that leader is less reactive, more balanced, and so on. So there is... I would defer, I wouldn't regard myself yeah. as a research expert, but having the University of Singapore do that research for us is really useful. Sarah, how, how do you sort of define success um, it, it, outcomes? I mean, you're doing it mostly one-on-one -on -one in couples um, or even the opposite. How do you know when something is futile or they need a, a different kind of service than what you're best at providing? Gosh, that's such a big question. But um, I guess a number of indicators. We do use uh, tools. So we do use standardized assessment, pre-post data to measure outcomes. So symptom, uh, symptoms of either mental illness or quality of life indicators. So we do use those as a data source. Um, the client self-report as well. Um, observations of their non-verbal and their verbal data uh, all kind of help us to, to see. Client engagement is another great um, uh, piece of information relating to outcome. 
if the client is not engaged and not motivated, then there will be no work done, you know? Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Jeremy, I think you're, you're more traditional in, in terms of outcomes. Um, I, you and I have been in the same space and, and, and are very simpatico with this, that HR suites want to know that they're saving money, that spending on programs has to reduce chronic disease markers um, and we can, and those are expensive to obtain even. So what, uh, what's the cost effective way to get this done? Uh, you're completely right. And I think the, the question that we always ask is who, who's paying for the healthcare, uh, you know, and these are the insurers and the corporates and oftentimes they refer to, you know, uh, tried and tested ways of uh, correlating that health status to cost. And therefore, we use the standard BMI, HbA1c's, you know, blood pressure, blood cholesterol, um, to to measure pre and post uh, uh, health uh, status. Uh, for corporates, though, uh, the interesting side is that when we bring in uh, the mental health measures, uh, we normally use DAS as the first port of call, uh, which, uh, for those who don't know, it, it, it refers to a depression, anxiety, and stress scale. Um, but we then, for those who are on a clinical pathway, for those who are more severe, then we bring in things like PHQ-9 and GAD-7 and all of that. But oftentimes when we talk to HR departments, that's the first time they can see quantified depression, anxiety, stress data for the employees, even though this scale has been around for a long time. Um, unfortunately, I think they struggle to uh, quantify what that economic impact is for their employee base because that has never been measured before. So we're trying to help them correlate that to indirect costs, right? Uh, performance, absenteeism, presenteeism, things like that, um, which takes a, a big amount to, you know, uh, work with their own internal performance data. How, that, you raise a very interesting point, smaller point, but we've often looked at absenteeism and presenteeism as issues, but with work from home, how do those metrics get measured? <laughs> That's a very, very different metric. So Stephen, I just like to say something uh, on the subject is, is we've, we've had this dilemma for nearly 20 years of proving behavior, some kind of behavior equals economic outcome. And if, for what it's worth, what we found is that the, the one absolutely accepted norm now in, in organizations is the engagement levels. And you've got a great place to work in Gallup and all these guys measure engagement. The trick, the trick is then to connect that behavior to engagement because to try and connect it to what we, at least in our efforts, try and connect a behavior to an economic outcome in a direct way is tenuous at best because market conditions are changing. So much dynamism, you, it's going to, you really struggle, but you can seem to connect and it's remeasured over and over again. Most organizations want to be a best employer. And what we've found is that they, organizations accept now that if we can prove that certain behaviors connect to engagement, they accept it as economic outcomes. So a uh, conflict here, uh, you know, speaking with my former CXA hat, we actually find that engagement was required, but not useful. That it's a straw man that may lead to something else. That if you can't get engagement, you won't get other changes. But engagement alone, so many companies that, that I've dealt with over the last five years don't want engagement because they find that it, it, in the long run, it didn't make the impact that they hoped for. But I think it's still, depending on who you're speaking with, it's kind of a, a, a barrier for entry, but it's, it's a straw man. Um, it, it seems to be a, a, you know, necessary, but not useful. Yeah. I think there, there is a, there is, I mean, I think in the organizational psychology literature, there's a lot around like burnout and engagement and stuff like that. And they, I think they refer to it as, you know, hygiene factors or motivational factors. So there are some factors that if aren't present are detrimental to the organization. Mm -hmm. Maybe engagement is one such factor, but mm -hmm. the presence of engagement does not necessarily lead to increased productivity. So I was just thinking that. Because, yeah. And, and then it, Productivity is one of those economic measures, but Jeremy would argue persuasively that it's the cost of diabetes and the, the cost of um, infections. And, and in the last 15 minutes we have here, um, if you guys want to address, it's, it's, it's a distant piece of tech, but there's the concept of the psychobiome, which is the relationship between your gut bacteria and your mood and how external stressors, it might change your diet and alcohol or your sport and fitness, and that changes your gut bacteria. And 
again, it, it's an interesting view of hygiene. Yeah. But I still think that it's going to, the world is moving to an even more objectified outcome around the, the pandemic, diabetes and obesity. And in my world, that's amplified because people who get the worst outcomes with COVID-19 have the comorbidities of diabetes and obesity and hypertension. Those are the top three co predictors that an age of, not get, of getting onto a ventilator and not getting off a ventilator. Jeremy, you wanna talk about cardiometabolic health and maybe gut health, mental health? Um, yeah, I think first and foremost, I think where, where this thing's going with the microbiome and it links to the brain and, and also specifically, you know, uh, neurological diseases is really interesting. And, you know, I guess, you know, maybe inspiration for you for being a bit of a medical futurist hat on as well. I think there is a lot of promise in other measurements as well, where people are doing in, you know, not only measuring chronic disease, but actually your, uh, age i guess you know separate from your chronological age is what your body age is because i guess age also underpins uh, chronic diseases as well um and i think you know i think this is where we can we've always talked about integrated care in medicine and all that bringing all of these things together and this belief that it all links and i think this is the beginnings of actually putting the science behind it and able to quantify different aspects of the integrated body um the, the second part i wanted to kind of address was that I think chronic disease itself, you know, we always talk about the, the cardiometabolic bit, but, you know, there's a huge overlap as well with, with mental health, which I think, you know, ties in nicely to the psychobiome is from our work, we found that there's almost a two thirds overlap uh, in terms of people who had severe BMI, blood pressure, sugars, and all of that tend to also have elevated levels of mental health risk, which is really interesting, right? I mean, there's lots of interest, literature that has been uh, 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 done on it. Uh, I think a lot of it has been in the, in the Western sphere, but uh, for us, it's exciting because we're seeing that play out in, in places like Malaysia as well. And I think that's, that's another reason why, you know, um, that addressing the, the, the person holistically, I mean, like similar to what Sarah and Michael has talked about, and, you know, and, and I think this is where as we understand the science a little bit more, I think, you know, it's going to, I guess, hopefully prove in the future why uh, doing things like this matters because it, it's all correlated. Absolutely. Uh, Michael, uh, Jeremy teed it up for you. Uh, aging, telomeres and mindfulness. <laughs> is, is, is that? <laughs> you, you yeah. Want to share so, on that? I mean, it's important. I mean, it's, all... it, it might, it's early, but it's important. Yeah, so, so you were referencing a conversation yesterday. Um, I mean, I've had the privilege of working with a lot of doctors in the last few years because we're working with one of the biggest pharma companies in the world. And it's really interesting to hear doctors feel, I've heard a lot of doctors express tremendous frustration that, that the, the, the profession, the GP profession at least, is treating the person as a body, not a mind. And there's not even nutrition on the table. And some doctors who take on nutrition and talk about nutrition to their patients are seen as weird by some of their colleagues. It's really interesting. Um, and so even in, 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 in Monash University, one of our collaborators, Craig Hassett, who's a, a doctor and associate professor there, in Monash, mindfulness is compulsory for uh, medical training. So if you're becoming a doctor in Monash, you will learn mindfulness. And there's evidence that those students that learn mindfulness burn out less. There's all kinds of good things that happen. But it's Craig who introduced me to the results on, on telomere. So, so you know, again, you guys will know more about what telomeres are because I'm not medically trained, yeah. but it's the end of the chromosome and it's a marker of age. It's a marker of marker biological of age. age. And it's yeah. reversible with, 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 with effort. That's for yes. sure. Yes. And there's been Sarah. fascinating research that shows that people who practice mindfulness 10 minutes a day over eight weeks, the telomeres recover, if that's the right term. In other words, you, it's, and I think it's to do simply with chronic stress. If the mind is, re, is, is, is well, chronic stress reduces, the body recovers. It's as simple as that. We, we have about eight minutes left. Um, let's, I want to start thinking about, start thinking about sort of a, a closing statement or something you want everyone to, to get across. But um, Sarah, how do you see this going forward? And how do you advise, I'm thinking about these outcomes and multidisciplinary approaches and the fact that you may see someone who, uh, you could see someone who has anxiety, but they also have uh, obesity and uh, substance abuse disorder. 
you know that you need you want to you have a multidisciplinary team and you meet every week but it's a multidisciplinary mental health team mm -hmm. how would a a psych, psychology group or even michael's team begin how would what would you want to add to your team to make it even more cross disciplinary right so while we don't have in house uh, cross disciplinary professionals we definitely work with GPs, with nutritionists, with dietitians, with psychiatrists in other practices, we definitely do not work alone. So already with, with clients who do need that, that cross-disciplinary support, we work very collaboratively with uh, these other professionals, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, Jeremy, as we start winding up, what, what do you think the big challenges are right now with COVID-19, how, how does it affect your business plans? And how does it affect, how would you begin to help individuals? What, what parting advice can you sort of share? Um, I think firstly with COVID, it's been a double-edged sword. Um, a lot of our uh, chronic disease programs whereby we needed to go on site to test people, that has sort of slowed down. But I think it's shone a spotlight on, on mental health issues and there's been an acceleration of interest there uh, because um, I think with social isolation and all of that, employers are finally realizing that mental health is really important for the employee base. I think looking forward and, and maybe just talking more broadly in technology and medicine and, and how we're pushing the boundary, I think that there are two very important things, right? specifically technology and mental health. Number one is pay, payers, right? When will insurers actually start paying for some of these services? You know, I think mood disorder specifically has been utterly neglected if we take the hat that it acts like chronic disease, right? It's, it's repeatable, it, it is a, there's, a, there's an escalation, and it's preventable. How do we get payers to pay for it? And the second bit is regulations, you know, from, from all the countries. Uh, you know, what we're doing, we hope to get regulated. We want to shape regulation, you know, in the US to get uh, regulated by CDC and FDA, but that doesn't exist in this region. So, you know, how do we make sure that what we're doing in medical technology is regulated to ensure that we're delivering the right clinical outcomes and not doing harm to the patients. Michael? Oh, I think the greatest challenge with technology is the engaged use of it. I mean, if you look at um, Robert Keegan's research out of Harvard, is that one in seven people will change their behavior uh, when their literal life depends on it because we've all got a very deep set habits and deep immunity to change. And I think that's what we, at least you see in the mindfulness space, you, you know, to get a person to download a mindfulness app is relatively easy. To get them to use it is very difficult. And I think that's, I think that's the big challenge and to help people understand uh, what's getting in their way. Um, because it's all well and good to give people the tools, but how do you help them overcome that inertia? This is one of the, and I think that's a big experimentation field for us, whether it be community or reminders or whatever it is, but Helping people help themselves is the great challenge, I think, of technology. And I think if I can just uh, add on to that, Michael, you know, so many of our clients have mindfulness apps, yeah. have fitness apps, have... Half a dozen. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's like we are in an age where we have a lot of access. Yes. But then it's like, how do you transform that into... Uh, informal use within your daily life and not five minutes yeah. in the morning I am mindful and five minutes right. at night, I am mindful That's you know right. yeah so that is yeah. that is a challenge right it's a big I, I, challenge and it's it's um yeah it's I, often anyways yeah, I'll, I'll it's a there. huge challenge I I've had the the mixed blessing being a cancer doctor and coming to this holistic approach to cancer prevention we have long emphasized that that we define health qualitatively and quantitatively mm -hmm. so that there, there there's a, a a marriage of those elements to say you're you're not sick and you're you're in states of health but the tools to get there are historically food choice activity sleep and mindfulness and mindfulness has always gotten the short shrift in this process because everyone likes to change their diet. Everyone thinks there's a magical diet out there that they, they didn't know, know about. 
and everyone complains of sleep, uh, but it's uh, very elusive to get the best sleep in today's hyper online world, distracting world. Exercise is, is almost the same kind of commitment that mindfulness is because you, I would think you have to get to mindfulness or even any mental health app the same way someone goes through a couch to 5K transition of just doing a little bit every day and then looking back and saying, wow, I've done this for so long. But, but you're right, I, I, I think I'm optimistic that now is a, a transition that, that mental health broadly, mindfulness as a tool and psychology still I think face-to-face -face as the gold standard um, play as important of a role and are gonna get their moment in the sun um, in the same way that Netflix and Airbnb and Uber did but it's going to be by disrupting the field. And, um, and, and maybe that's kind of a good way to, to, to stop. Marilyn, do you want to go five more minutes or have any administrative questions or comments? I just want to make sure we answer some of the questions from the people, but um, I'm happy to, to keep a few minutes more. But people usually drop right there, so um, we can close ourselves a bit later. I'll let you take the look at the, the questions. Um, I just want to say, so I've, um, from my side, what I've heard is that when people can download, people can talk to therapists to digital, so that's great. We need to get through the engagement part of the technology. I think this is an issue. Um, I think changing our behavior, we all know how hard it is and all of us are, uh, we can testify personally. For sure, I understood that insurers and uh, Nalori has proven that and corporates uh, are, are, are are getting into helping uh, their employees and uh, their uh, insured uh, people to to get there. Yeah, so that's a, it's something. Uh, to me, the only thing I can say from an APAC med perspective is uh, my question is: Did COVID nineteen uh, enable a destigmatize? Oh, I cannot say that enough. Destigmatization. Destigmatize mental health. Destigmatize mental health. En français. <laughs> Because this this is something we're talking like very freely today with a therapist online. I mean, how many of us have um, admitted uh, that we are talking about it? And I think that's for me something that maybe COVID-19 more than digital acceleration or enablement has allowed us to talk about it. And I know it's not a topic that we all want to, you know, put out there. So that's my point. Uh, but please, uh, a few minutes to answer some of the questions, maybe burning questions. Uh, this, uh, record, this recording will be online so people can access it and I'll make sure that people hear it because there were some great comments. Um, so thank you. There is a Twitter account that you can retweet if you've liked it. And if you want a second series of mental health, we'll bring more speakers and more technology uh, because a lot of us are trying to find the right help. I, of course, want to thank everyone here that has joined, but uh, the speakers and our moderator. Uh, thank, thank you for bringing, you know, doctors, analysts, and uh, experience to, to, to the MedTech uh, Forum. Thank you. Now, please, again. Great. I you. think we've answered almost all but one of the questions. Jeremy just chimed in on a, a question between, you know, someone in cardiac med tech and post-procedure, post-surgery, mental health issues, it's well documented. And it's, it's complicated because that could be surgery, but it may also be anesthesia for some people. But there's definitely, yeah, I, Sarah can punish me, but I would say a form of PTSD or there's post-surgical mental health change. And the only other question I don't think we, we really hit on that, that I'll try to answer is, uh, where did that go? Isn't cognitive performance and neurologic performance linked to physiologic alignment? And if so, isn't the body-mind connection in an evidence-based format a requirement, what we need? And I would say yes. I mean, I, I, I think that we, we still need better evidence. Uh, and I, I even, sometimes I loathe to say that because as a practitioner, I work off of a case series, uh, you know, numerous anecdotes, one after another in my office, but you go nowhere if you don't write it down. And, and, and the whole key is keeping, keeping track. And even if it's a, a series, uh, you know, Jeremy's not running a randomized clinical trial, but he's got to be able to show that what he does has an impact. And so I would encourage everyone that you, you, 
you have to create data and data is created through digital technologies and those need to be passive and not active and that that's just the way it's going to go um so that's my, my two cents on the last question i would add in there are a few articles i referenced about cognitive cbt in the digital age uh some things about the psychobiome and and digital mental health i will share those articles with um uh, apac medtech they're they're all not they're not behind firewalls and free to distribute so um you can pass those out to everyone thank you thank you really um everyone still people were listening so um recording will be live um may i ask all the speakers to wave so we can close that video nicely and i say bye bye thank you very much and have a good day and a good lunch maybe thank you everyone thank, thank you, you. <laughs> thanks everyone bye. thank you bye.